Live from Beit Shemesh and broadcasted around the world, you are listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with your host, Naham Klegman. Interviews and advice from Jewish entrepreneurs from around the world. Listen, learn, be Masliach. Welcome to episode 11 of the From Entrepreneur. And today I have with me a special guest, David Mark. David is the founder of Funds, which is a global community of supporters of entrepreneurs, mentors, creating a new way of microfinancing, uh, I guess helping startups. It's really a privilege to have David with us. David, you there? Yep. Thanks for having me, Nahum. Uh, it's a pleasure. I, I love meeting other entrepreneurs and meeting people that are helping the ecosystem. I wanted to you know, first get a little bit of an overview of what Funds is all about. Then we'll talk a little bit about more about your background, how you came to Funds, and uh, then we'll dig in a little bit deeper. How's that sound? Sounds good. Excellent. So tell us about Funds. So Funds is really an outgrowth of a lot of the work we've done with equity crowdfunding platforms uh, around the world. And we sort of finding a way to one find a way to streamline a few different components. One, uh, consulting. And, and number two, really like financing opportunities for young startups in emerging markets. Uh, this could be Africa, Asia, South America. Uh, we get tons and tons of emails every day and from startups around the world saying, hey, can you help me get a $30,000, even a half a million dollars? And obviously, they you know access to cash in these places is very, very limited. Uh, there's a great angel community in Africa, but if you're not part of the angel community, uh, you really have no opportunities to get out ahead. And most of these startups don't really realize they can do a lot with a little. So, you know, they want to raise half a million dollars and really all they need is $5,000 mm-hmm. uh, to get jump started. So it's starting. We're building a community and we're, we're building a uh, outreach to startups. And uh, we, we hope to be uh, fully launched another month, month and a half. Very interesting. So this is basically like, I mean, we've heard of uh, stories of little tiny villages, you know, in places where the woman will make bracelets or something and then being able to turn that into a viable product that can be sold worldwide and sort of give an income and literally change around a whole village. Is that the type of idea? So we're, you know, we're trying to stay away from that because it's like a sort of a Kiva model or someone going from Kiva to to Kickstarter. We're trying to get into the idea that there are a lot of, let's say a young team in the middle of Cape Town that, okay, there's an angel community there, but they don't themselves don't have access to that. Mm -hmm. So they, they have computers, they know how to program and they have a great idea. And instead of going and trying to get a half million dollars, which they could get maybe, uh, but then again, they're competing with how many other people for that same half million. They can come to us and get $5,000, $10,000 and get jump started at least for an MVP and then maybe set themselves up for the angel funding they were looking for before. Okay. So I'm gonna, I definitely want to delve into this a lot more, but let's talk a little bit more about yourself and let our audience get to know you. Sure. So what's your story? Where'd you come from? Where'd you grow up? How'd you end up in Israel? And uh, how'd you get into funds? So I grew up in upstate New York, near Woodstock, in a town called New Paltz. Nice. Um, so I had very uh, diverse uh, upbringing, <laughs> access to different ideas, uh, different uh, cultures. And uh, I moved to Israel 14 years ago after I became from. Oh, wow. Where did you and, come from? Uh, in Africa. In Africa. Okay, so you, so you just get the whole – you went from New York, upstate New York to Israel and forgetting so, uh, the Africa part. So, uh, so, so a guy living in upstate New York doesn't become from just because he meets uh, some Chabad on the street. He has to have some, <laughs> something happen to him. So I, uh, I was on a trip, uh, actually a Jewish trip, uh, t- uh, quote-unquote Tikkun Olam, to help poor, disparate Africans in uh, East Ghana build a school. And I came down with malaria. And I oh, wow. uh, almost didn't make it uh, in this uh, mud hut village. And I uh, decided to turn my life around and find God. It didn't happen all at once, but I uh, ended up jump starting me and uh, asking the right questions. Amazing. And uh, we ended up in Israel afterwards and went to Sfat. And, uh, the trip, it was a, it was a oh, Jewish okay. trip. So it was a, kind of like a, the trip was bifurcated into like a Ghana part and a uh, Israel part. So the Israel part kind of was the extra inspiration after the, uh, what happened to me in Africa. So. So you had malaria in – how long was the program in, in Africa? Four weeks. Four weeks and you got malaria there and then you went to Israel with the malaria? It, it doesn't always go away. I mean you know, this was uh, – this kind of uh, malaria supposedly doesn't come back. But you know, it, uh, in the early days, it kind of hit every once, every once in a while, every year, every two years and just a minor fever. Mm-hmm. But, but it set me up to do tshuva. So it was uh, an important experience clearly. So now you're in Eretz Israel as part of this trip. And you start asking questions. So where'd you go to ask these questions? So we were in Spot. We went to Karlbach. And then uh, obviously we went back to America after four weeks, three weeks, four weeks. Okay. And the next year, I was my last year in college. And I ended up connecting to from people I have from family. And I ended up going there for Shabbos. And, you know, just, I was more Mutchazek after a while and then came to Or Sameach after the year. Beautiful. So after college, so you came to Eretz Israel. You went to Or Sameach, and this is about fourteen. Years fourteen, ago? about fourteen years ago. Yeah, went to let's see, I went to Or Sameach, and then about a year and a half met my wife. 
went to Ish, and then we went to Yeshiva Ta Miftar for Kolo. Very nice. So, and then work wise, how did you get to, what were you doing, and how did you get to the funds? So, I started off after Kolo at a company called Rank Above. I'm sure. sure. You so, for a few months, and then um, I have two brother in laws that are very high up in the tech world, uh, high tech world in LA. And one of them offered me a job to manage his multi uh, kind of faceted different sites in health uh, in terms of SEO. So, mm-hmm. I worked on that for about a year and a half, then took some time off doing some other stuff here, and then went back to work for a company called Five Blocks, based out of Alon Shaboot. Um, now they're in a fraught. Uh, I heard of Five Blocks, sir. Sure. Their reputation management firm. I became a, the director of web strategy there, and was there for about three years, and decided to break off and uh, start my own company. Clearly know what I wanted to do, but <laughs> decided to do my own thing, like everybody else does. Right, right. And got some seed money for an idea I wanted to, get, wanted to do. It didn't go as far as I wanted to. Okay. Uh, but in the process of that uh, building, we uh, hooked up with our crowd right. in, the early, in the early, early days. Right. And right. we've been consulting with them uh, ever since. So Beautiful. we were able to help them build an investor community and took those basic concepts of building an investor community and took them to other equity crowdfunding platforms. So we've worked with uh, at least five or six from around the world, different niches. And it kind of began to grow in this direction. And we recognize that this is a direction that we're very good at and we understand very one of the few players that understand different facets of it that we um, that other people just don't understand interesting so you basically you act as advisors to crowdfunding platforms that want to basically grow their uh, community that's right so we, we really understand i think unlike a lot of other people in the industry because we've had the opportunity to work with different kinds and in different stages we actually understand where it's going what the problems are what the hiccups are you know, in general you know what makes it work Ones that work better, ones that work uh, less good. So uh, now we're not just to be clear. We're not talking about uh, Kickstarter type stuff or Indiegogo. We're talking more about microfinancing, uh, angel investing through crowdfunding. Correct. That's right. This is an equity. Uh, this is a, what would be called an exchange of securities, an equity or uh, exchange of uh, issuance of a uh, share. Somebody uh, you know invests in a company. They're they're getting shares from this. This, this became legal around 2012, 2013, maybe. Right. Like that. And so this is very new, and it's become a very big industry very fast. Uh, in a very unknown industry, you know. Along I would assume still, you know, changing, uh, changing by the week. All the time. You know, you'll, I would tell you, uh, could tell you that you know, we've had platforms that were flush with cash in terms of operational funds, and three months later they went under. Or not under, but had to change their entire model because right. they went through their operational funding. And, you know, if they're waiting for an investment to be returned on a deal that they invested on, that does, that's not operational funding. They have to actually raise their own money to run the company. So yeah. you might have a company that's like, Invested in three or four deals, but they have no money to actually run day to day operations. Operations, yeah. Interesting. So you guys are basically you're on top of the legal aspects in the states as well. That's right. Because I mean, you're, you're definitely talking about a multi billion dollar industry that you know five years from now is going to be you know just like people for the last I don't know hundred years invested in stocks and mutual funds. You know, we're I guess it's I think it's going to become as simple for anybody to be able to invest in a startup or invest in a community, um, maybe a social entrepreneur uh, project. So, I mean, you're definitely in the right space and <laughs> definitely at the right time. For sure. How long do you think it's going to be till things are made that simple that, hey, I could deduct $1,000 from my uh, paycheck and, you know, have it automatically go into a, uh, you know, into a project? I, I don't think it'll take that long. The question will be the challenge of explaining to individuals the nature of how this type of stuff works. Uh, most people don't like the idea that they'll lose their money on a lot of their investments. Mm-hmm. It, it's something that scares people. I mean, I could tell you, uh, I'm not going to mention the platform, but you know, there were been investors in particular platforms that we work with that got very angry because they lost money. And, and these are platforms that explain to these, and these are investors with a lot of money, accredited investors, and they still sure. didn't understand or didn't appreciate the fact that it's only about every 20 investments, one will return a good sum of money. Everything else will go on our belly up or not return anything for 10 10 years, five, 10 years. Right, so right, th- right. these are the types of investments that people, it's hard to make that connection. What I, I see happening actually is real estate will go very big and energy crowdfunding will go very big. What I don't see yet happening is the ability to communicate why angel investing or startup crowdfunding will get to the same level of assurance for these types of people. You don't see it going that far. I, I, it could, but that communication gap remains. And it remains for big investors or it remains for... Small well, isn't that, I mean, isn't that how mutual funds work, uh, you know, in a way? You just invest, you know, a fund is, is invest in several stocks and some will go up, some will go down, but uh, you're hoping overall the performance of the fund you know, does well? 
So I think that's what's going to end up happening is instead of investing in individual companies, you'll be able to invest in a fund and mm-hmm. you'll have to trust that fund will make the right decisions in terms of startups. So yeah, you'll lose on seven startups, but it won't affect your money because that fund is diversified across the, a variety of different uh, investments. Okay, and so- I, I, I see it going that way. OutCrowd's gone that way. Health Funder, one of our customers, has definitely gone that way. Every single person we've talked to, if they haven't gone that way, we've pushed them in that direction because it's the healthiest way to ensure that your users are going to feel safe in terms of investing. Yeah, that makes actually that makes a lot of sense because, you know, even if you're like, um, you know, our crowd and you go and you, you want to support uh, an Israeli startup, but you, you know, and you like the ideas and stuff, but you don't, you're not doing the real due diligence that's necessary, you know, when you're putting 50000 or $100,000 into a project because you're, you're trusting our crowd. But, you know, as you said, you know, even with VCs, you know, every 10 investments, they expect seven to go under and two to do okay and one to hopefully hit it out of the park. That's right. So you need a lot of patience, and uh, I guess that model makes less sense in investing into a fund overall and let the people that are, have the time and the expertise to do the due diligence and pick the right uh, startups to invest in. I actually like that a lot. So let me ask you this. Let's say I put together a fund, let's say of a million dollars, How and uh, I want to you know, invest in, uh, in different startups. How easy is that for me to set up today? I mean, there's legal aspects to do that. I, you know, we've, we're wondering ourselves would be the best thing to do. I, I think there's a lot of legal aspects that just loopholes you're going to have to get through. Israel's pretty tight on that, by the way. It's mm-hmm. not the easiest thing to do. America's loosening up. But uh, many of these funds aren't actual funds themselves. They work through what's called dealer brokers that are already legally passed through all the loopholes. Uh, these are you know, anywhere from taking tests to being you know, an act, a licensed dealer broker. And that could take a while to be approved. So you know, in the kind of the lightning fast movement of this kind of ecosystem, these people don't want to wait that long. So these dealer brokers, and there's big ones out there, uh, sign these platforms up to, be work, to work through them so they can, everything can be legal. Interesting. So you'd have to get the, the sort of, a, where do you get that license? How do you? Uh... It's to apply through the SEC. That's, that's just in America. In terms of the Israel uh, angle, actually, we're not, I'm not so accustomed to that since we're dealing with most of the U.S., Okay, but technically, if you're in the U.S. and you set up a fund, you can probably invest through you know another uh, company in Israel to get to the. That's the, right. That's right. Yeah. No, Israel's good, not going to not going to go against whatever the uh, setup is in America. That's for sure. Right. Very interesting. I mean, it's a really fascinating um, industry that's Definitely. happening right before our eyes and uh, changing very fast and opening up opportunities. But just you know, like you were saying before, you know, investors, even though you know, you have to be careful of being, you know, uh, of thinking that investing is like winning a, is like playing the lottery. Now you have somebody that's saying, okay, you know, you believe in this company, you put fifty thousand dollars in, and you're expecting it to be the next Google, and in three years, you're, you're hoping to turn that fifty thousand to half a million. That is not the norm. That's right. It's not, right. The, it's not the norm. And another thing is the myth that this is really very similar to Kickstarter or Indiegogo, let's say, is really just not. It's a big myth out there, and it, it, part of the problem is it's called equity crowdfunding. So everybody thinks right. it's a large crowd. These are not large groups of people. These are, you know. Our largest group of people that we've worked with in terms of companies, they have 70,000, seven or 8,000 users or uh-huh. investors, and most of them aren't investing. These are groups of investors that are credited. It's called equity crowdfunding. Bay. And in all honesty, I think they're, I would call them large online investment clubs that also invest along institutional investment. Institutional mm-hmm. investors, which are example GE Ventures, uh, you know, uh, Microsoft can come and invest alongside a group of investors. Uh, this happens across the board in terms of equity uh, crowdfunding platforms. And one of our customers, Health Funder, they're hooked up with two or three angel groups in America itself. So it's not everybody, it's not funded 100% by the crowd. It's maybe 30% by the crowd and the other 70% uh, invested by uh, banks or other institutional investments, mm-hmm. family offices, things like that. So it's basically, it's having your portfolio, now equity crowdfunding is becoming a piece of your portfolio. That's right. It's called, considered an alternative investment class. Mm-hmm. Very interesting. And to be a credited uh, investor, so that has gone down, right? It used to be you had to have a million dollars in assets or in liquid to be a credited investor, or has that changed? That hasn't changed. The It changed from the early days, but in the last two years, it hasn't changed. The Jobs 3, which looks like it's going to pass, will allow the non-accredited investor to invest, but under certain regulations. Uh, they, they have not cleared those up yet. That's why it's, it hasn't passed yet. But the Jobs 2 had to allow the credit investors to be to invest and to be generally solicited. So an accredited investor, you're right, is about a million dollars. They're worth a million dollars and or make $200,000 a year. That million dollars mm-hmm. can't be part of their um, primary house, though. It's I mean, not, oh, okay. Their primary house estate. is not included in, in, inside the million dollar. Uh, they can have real estate holdings that aren't part of their primary residence, but, right. but the primary, primary residence is not part of the million dollars. So, And if this Jobs 3 Act uh, passes, 
So then you don't have to be a credit investor, but you said there would be some sort of regulations, like what type of things. Like if I'm just a regular guy, I make 150000 a year, and I want to put $10,000 uh, into a startup. You know, would I, will I be able to just do that? The numbers are not exact, but the numbers I don't have exact right now, but there's a certain percentage of your income you're allowed to put in. That's it. You, you can't be uh, – and then they have to check with the, ta- the uh, tax story. will check to see if, you know, this will be you know, included in a return or not. So they, they're only allowed to be a certain amount of money you're allowed to put in. Before. Right. You don't want somebody betting your house literally they're on very a startup nervous about and they it. get word of and they get all excited about it and then they're, uh, next thing you know, they, they lose their home. That's right. But most people like uh, the crowdfunding community goes in both ways. There are a lot of, uh, let's say, ideas ideological uh, leaders in it, and they would love to have everybody invest anything they want to invest. And, and I, you know, I'm not a government person at all. I, I'm, I'm quite a libertarian, but I do understand the, for once, <laughs> I actually understand the fear that the government has that you have a, you know, have a tremendous amount of people that like to gamble, that like to do all sorts of different things, and thinking it's like a stock market, and they're going to be investing their savings into these types of uh, startups. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about funds. So funds is what we just talked about, is the advisory company that advises these equity crowdfunding platforms or you were mentioning before you actually created your own uh, equity crowdfunding for places such uh, in Africa so what we did is we originally built funds as, as an advisory company what we've noticed over a period of time is because of the ecosystem is very rocky it's up and down uh, to find enough stable companies out there where we can uh, have long-term income from them it, it is tough it, it remains a consultancy if that's the case so we, we wanted to do something with our know-how that was in a few aspects. One, that would incorporate all the stuff we've been doing. And two, we feel good about ourselves giving back to small startups. Mm-hmm. And also, we, we realize it has to be some sort of funding quality to it. We're not an equity crowdfunding platform. We're not a dealer broker, so we can't can't be. Um, what we we're relying on is donations. In a sense, donations, if you want to put it uh, you know, simply. It's not exactly donations. I'd call it a support model where, a let's say, a person in New York feels very strongly about helping a particular startup they like in our community, they can put $10 a month in, $100 a month in, and it's recurring. And they become basically part of the team. It's, they're part of the community. They can give advice when they want to give advice. They can say, hey, listen, if you want me to keep on funding you, you have to do this and this and this. It's just a very nice kind of mutual uh, relationship going on between the startups and the people funding them. I like that. I mean, I, I like that a lot. That's, uh, that's fantastic. But the question is, so then why only, you know, let's say places in Africa or India, why not even locally? Why not in Israel? Why not in America? And this sounds like the, a great platform for anybody who wants to get in, uh, involved. It, it could work that way in the future. My, my feeling is that impact investing, it's called impact investing, right. uh, works great when you have a, a needy area that an impact investor might say, listen, I'm not going to make my money back. If I do that, it's great. It's a high risk, but I feel good about putting X amount of money into this area. And, and they'll put a half a million dollars into companies. Into, oh, yeah? You know, in Mongolia, in, you know, poor areas of India. But uh, we're not going for that kind of cash. So I want to take the same sort of mentality of impact investing and kind of bring down the level of money without any sort of uh, securities exchange. So you know, most of this impact investing is really seductive at the end of the day. I mean, the idea that you're going to get your money back from an investment in, in Central Africa that you put uh, $30,000 into, you might, but you're very high risk. Then again, so, you know, they feel good about themselves. So when they're signing off on that $30,000 donation or whatever it is, is it considered a donation? Is it considered an investment? Is it turned into investment at some point down the line if they are successful? How does that work? So for uh, for our model, we're not going after thirty thousand dollars. It's five hundred bucks, a thousand dollars. It's very very small amounts of money. Okay. Uh, we're, we're not a we're not a uh, nonprofit. I wanted to stay away from that. Kiva did that model, and I think it's fine, but it only allows you to grow so much, and you don't really have the corporate pool that you need to have. Mm-hmm. I think right now what we're testing the waters at is, is if a community. The idea of real crowdfunding should be community generated. So if the community is large enough, people will feel good about the startups themselves to want to put some money to help them out. I do foresee it happening that they can have their own negotiations on the side for more money. And, you know, it's sort of the idea that uh, people want to see where it's going. So they're willing to put 500 bucks to see, test them is a good enough idea. And it's a good enough idea. They can always come back and give them more for their own, you know, make a decision between the two. And the entrepreneurs in the company, what do they post like weekly updates? They you know, let you in on what's going on behind the scenes. That, that'll be the idea. The, the idea that is that the startups have to post that. They're also going to be part of the community in the same groups that these uh, funders and mentors are at. So they're all going to know, they're going to know each other at the end of the day. They're going to ask for, if they're not giving the updates, the funders will ask for updates. There's no question about it. So that's part of uh, like, you know, Kickstarter and, and Indiegogo work on getting a, a piece of the action. So it's be a t-shirt, uh, you know, a piece of the actual device. Right, this is more like back to you. That's right. So this is more the same idea, but it's uh, ideas oriented. You know, a funder will feel part of the team or feel that they're actually in it with them since they're all on the same community. 
That's cool. You know what? In a sense, and I'm just thinking out loud now, it's kind of like uh, real-world gaming. Like here you're actually able to play an entrepreneurial game. Where you could get in with a team of founders that are creating something, put some money in to play the game, and then you could give advice, learn from them, go back and forth, and see how a company grows from you know startup to you know hopefully full funding, and plus give you the opportunity to invest more down the line. It's a, it's a good way to look at it, I think. Yeah, I like that actually, and if and it feels good, you know, because you're helping out and you're you're helping a community and and grow. But you said like some of these companies they were looking for, for a quarter million, half a million dollars, and you're saying, hey, no, you know, only raise fifty thousand dollars. Is that really enough money to get them through to the next level? I would say even raise five thousand dollars. So give me give me a, give us a case scenario. A perfect example is a company just contacted me the other day. They said they want anywhere between a half a million to one point five million dollars. So nice. I said. This is a company in India. It's a consulting firm with some sort of technology. Uh, very nice people. Uh, the presentation was lacking. I told them that. And I said, the chance of you getting investment on that level at this point is almost zero. Hmm. And I said, I, most companies, most investors want to see a working MVP with some users. And you don't need a half million dollars to put that together. In fact, you can do that on the side of your other job, right? You can actually just do that at night. Right. And she was like, you make sense what you're saying. And, and I said, you know, if you had $5,000, you could finish what you need to finish. If you need visas, get visas to go travel to places or sit there for two or three. You, you can, what you need, you, know, you list what you need and you could figure it out in the short term. Obviously, you want that big bucks. But the idea of, of seed investment is not necessarily to live off of it. Right. Uh, and for, it's to make it rich off your seed investment. It's to enable you to become a solid company and get where you need to get to. Right, meaning you know, spruce up your presentation, to get an MVP out there, minimum viable product, uh, show uh, some minimal traction or feedback from you know, your uh, users or, I guess, uh, buyers, depending on what it is. Now, are you, are you, is it strictly technology type stuff or even uh, product based? In, in the early days, I think we've discussed it. We want to stay with vetted companies that people sort of know. We have a very good. Uh, a young partner in the UK is actually originally from Rwanda and Kenya, and he's very, very hooked into the angel scene, angel network in Africa. What's his name? His name is Sean Obadiah. I'll send you the link afterwards. Very nice guy, and he, he really liked what we're doing, and he's really come on board. And he really understands the ground there. And you know, he and I were discussing uh, early on with the idea of working through some of the angel groups there. Mm-hmm. That the guys that don't cut it, that don't make it to their angel group. We're going to take under because at the end of the day, those are guys that are almost there, but they need a little extra nikuda, so to speak. So we can help them out with that. Even if it's not money right away, it's it's a uh, advice, guidance from the crowd, from the larger community. Yeah, it's, a, it's a great model. I mean, it's uh, really fantastic. So when are you fully launched? When are you officially like, getting really going out there? What status are you at? I, I like to do things in stages. Right now, we're, I would say, anywhere like a little bit post-MVP. We have a working model. We have not launched marketing yet. I'm still working out some kinks. So I want to make some more, more partnerships. Mm-hmm. We're hoping in the next month, month and a half, we launch the beta. Great. And do you see the governments that you're working with putting money into these type of ventures or the cities on a municipal uh, level? I think m- my big thing is not to really deal with government. I think it's, it blocks people. Mm-hmm. So I, I prefer just to go uh, bottom up. I hear that. It's just that sometimes, uh, like, you know, it's definitely in the interest of the communities to fund their entrepreneurs and uh, help businesses grow because that creates jobs and obviously uh, is just overall beneficial throughout the, um, for the whole community. But here you're saying, you know, you want to stay away from the red tape or stay away from, uh, I guess, any say outside of the company. It's true. The the emerging markets themselves, um, these uh, economies are going through a lot of changes. It's not the easiest thing to work with governments from these uh, places. It's a lot easier to force the change from on the ground Mm -hmm. and force the governments to come in later on. Mm -hmm. And what about, as you're saying, there are people that want to see these companies succeed, whether it's, you know, because they believe in the community, they just want to help out the world or, you know, as you mentioned earlier, Tikhan Olam approach. But, you know, is this something that can receive foundation grants and stuff like that? Or is it only because it's for profit, you wouldn't be able to tap into that market? So it's it's a challenge. If we went the nonprofit route, I, I'm sure it could receive grants. I, I'm you know it, the, the question is is you know Kiva has to do very mi- small loans and it's great. The, the question is is as a product or as a platform, could it really grow as a as a model if it was nonprofit? That, that's the only question. If it can, then then it, it should be nonprofit. And it would actually open up the doors for funding for the actual platform. If it can't grow that way, then we would have to actually. It's better to keep it private. Mm-hmm. And throughout the process, where does funds stay with a company 
or like after they sort of hatch, are they on their own or do you guys see yourselves working with them and being part of the community? Even if they raise $10 million, like you guys will still be uh, part of it. I mean, I would love the, if someone raised, if they raised $10 million somewhere else and we will still part of the original community, that'd be great. First of all, as a mentor, as giving back to the other guys that came on board, that'd be, that's the ideal. I, I think the idea of opening up a community is enables these startups and their supporters to stay on for the long term. It's something I learned from working with other crowdfunding platforms that they sort of did it the opposite. They opened up an investment corridor without any sort of community. And I think most investors and most startups would do well to be in the same community and learn and grow from each other. Yeah, 100%. 100%. I mean, that's why uh, incubators, I think, work so well. That's right. Very interesting. So you guys, you're just getting started with funds. Where do you see the vision 10 years from now, five years from now? Where do you hope to be? I would, I would hope to be, uh, I think, let's say a year from now, let's say anywhere between 1,000 to 5,000 users and uh, 200 startups. And so like if you're, if you're one of the 1,500, 2,000 uh, users, that means that you're investing in one, two, three or more different projects, correct? That's right. If you're investing or you're supporting through guidance, discussions. Wow. I really, really love what you're doing. What drove you? Like, what made you want to get into this? Into this particular part of where, where we're going? Yeah, and, well, into funds, into the whole idea of, of community helping and you know, helping emerging markets, getting th- involved in startups. I think what, what ended up happening is we were starting to – one of the platforms we consult with is an equity-based emerging markets platform. It, it's not even close to what we're doing. They, they're investing half a million dollars, a million dollars. So it's a different, whole different uh, end of the spectrum. But I, I started noticing – this is really starting three, four, five months ago – that this sort of intersection between – us receiving lots of these you know, inquiries over LinkedIn, normally basically over LinkedIn, and us seeing, wow, there's a big thing going out there in the world. And it's not just happening in Israel. It's really happening across the board from Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia, Bangkok, Thailand, Lagos, Nigeria. It's happening really fast, and, but it's happening in, in a very chaotic way. And we really felt this intersection was happening. And uh, you know, Tikkun Olam is a very big thing, being, being a light to the, to the non-Jewish world is, is very important. And so uh, I think, you know, Israel has the ability to do that now. And the idea to, just to be a charity organization isn't necessarily the only way to do that. Uh, enabling people to build their own futures is probably the best way to go about doing it. You know, as, as an entrepreneur, I would agree with that. <laughs> so let me ask you uh, some other side questions. But, you know, if you're an entrepreneur and you're looking to start up, what's, what's some of the advice you would give them? I would say you first need a lot of them, and bitachon. Not to me. Mm-hmm. There's no question about it. There's ups and downs. You're not going to get it right right away. In fact, you're going to fail. There's no, mm-hmm. no question about it. It's, it's impossible to get it right right away because everybody's different. You know, the advice you're going to get is the advice that those people went through, not what you went through right. or going through. And so, therefore, it's a, everybody has to learn on their own. You're going to lose money. You're going to, you know, but it's very highly rewarding. And sticking with it is frees a person from shackling their ideas to other people and to actually developing their ideas in a, in a very wide wide way. Hmm, very good. And do you have any books that you would recommend for an entrepreneur to read? The Lean Startup uh, is probably the best one. I, I, I found, I found it very grat- Yeah, I found it very gratifying. And I think it's, uh, it's really a healthy approach. I always tell myself, if I followed that approach 100%, we'd, we'd have been much better off two years ago. <laughs> but then again, you know, like, if we were been better off two years ago, we might not have moved into this direction the last year and a half. So everything is Yad Hashem. And that's, you know, from people have a much, in a lot of ways, much easier in the sense that, you know, we have, you know, uh, this inbuilt in Munah that, you know, we translate that to the business world, which we're supposed to. I think it, it, would, it does us very nicely to, to, to get through the initial two to three year stretch. So just staying on this uh, Hashkafa uh, level, what would you say? Obviously, everything's a matter of Hishtadlis. So where would you say Hishtadlis starts and Hishtadlis ends with, with a startup? I would say... It's a, it's a very good, it's a very, very good question. You know, I was coming back from work the other day, I think yesterday, and I thought to myself, I really don't have to work so much. You know, you, it's, you get to a point where you, if you, it's, it's how much you work when you're working, not how many hours you're working. So I think the shtadlis, you have to know yourself really well, and you have to be able to let go of needless things. There's a lot of, there's this kind of nature in an entrepreneur to be working 10 hours a day. And it's true in the beginning, you really have to like put in extra hours, and your family has to get to understand that. And there's a point in time where, when you know your model already and you know your product and all you have to do is really just push it forward. And I think there's a, Hashem expects you not to overdo it. And I think mm-hmm. there, there is this balance and you just have to know yourself. There's, you know, you have to do a lot of people to do it and <laughs> get to a point where you, you acknowledge that you don't really have to do the amount of Hishtavos you originally thought you did. So you're saying it's more quality than quantity in two That's hours. Right. That's right. I find myself when I'm, when I'm working too much, I don't get the level of, uh, the level I need. 
You know, it was uh, my best ideas are when I'm just walking down the street and I and I get one and I write it down right away and I move forward and I I don't like sit there and drill it till three in the morning. When I work till three in the morning, it doesn't always produce the best outcomes. You know, it's funny for me. For me, my best ideas come to me on Shabbos. <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's, it's so frustrating. I think it's because like on Shabbos is when my mind finally I get to relax. I, I get to stop thinking. I get to stop you know just try to concentrate on uh, Hashem and family and Shabbos, and then it frees up your mind, and all of a sudden the ideas start pouring in. I'm like, no. <laughs> the uh, Sitra Akra is uh, throwing the other stuff at you. So. <laughs> yes. And then I always say, but here, who are in Mutarim, right? That's what, uh, <laughs> you got to remember the here or that's the problem. So. <laughs> all right. You know what? I think this has been absolutely fantastic. I really appreciate you taking the time and coming on the show and sharing your thoughts and your ideas. I think it's a very exciting industry that you're in and that you're you're leading in a sense. I think, you know, uh, I'll put a link to your website, obviously, in our show notes. And, you know, people want to reach out to you, have questions about equity crowdfunding, or they want to get involved in a funds project. I think it's fantastic. I think what you're doing is fantastic. And this has been uh, really awesome speaking with you. Great. Thanks for having me on. Thank you, David. Have a great week. Take care. Thank you for listening to the From Entrepreneur Podcast with Nahum Kligman. We hope you learned something valuable and will share this with your friends. For show notes, archives of previous episodes, and more information to help you start and grow your business, please visit our website, www.fromentrepreneur.com. Listen, learn, be Masliach.